uh, for the very generous introduction. I, I want to thank um, Margaret, Melanie, and Stefan uh, for the invitation. It's an honor to be here, uh, and I'm especially pleased to develop the synergies that Stefan mentioned um, and to learn about the, the research network that's being put together here at Sussex. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the presentations uh, that are coming during the day, although I'm going to have to skip between all of the different uh, concurrent panels just to get, a, to get a sense of the range of, of work that's being done in this area. Um, I should say that I'm um, certainly happy to bring some California sunshine here, although I personally was hoping for some clouds after uh, <laughs> several hundred consecutive days of sun in, in Los Angeles, so I'm a little bit disappointed, but I hope it's, it, I guess none of us are really enjoying the sun while we're inside here in any case. Um, so let me begin. The, the theme of this conference presents at first a, a provocative juxtaposition. On the one hand, genomics, indicating a world of cutting edge life science as it is translated into biomedical innovation. Whether conducted in government sponsored academic research centers or venture funded biotechnology companies, such research is typically geared toward the afflictions of the aging populations of the wealthy world. On the other hand, global health which points to the often neglected and, understate and underfunded health problems of the developing world, seen to, either elude, seen to elude either state or market-based solutions, these problems are often placed under the purview of development agencies, philanthropies, or humanitarian NGOs. As we can see from today's program, there are multiple ways in which these two worlds are now becoming entangled. One can think, for example, of efforts to develop genomic surveillance of infectious disease evolution in order to track the emergence of drug resistance, or genetic epidemiology initiatives that seek to understand the relationship between human genetic variation and population differences in disease <coughs> distribution. Looking at these entanglements, the conference organizers have asked, what do contemporary advances in the sciences of life and in the technical capacity to manipulate the basic elements of life imply for long-standing inequities in the provision of health at a global scale, for the production of new individual and collective identities, and for the potential creation of new insecurities. In my remarks this morning, I want to pose an additional question that I think cannot be ignored in addressing the above. And that question is, what exactly do we mean by global health? For despite the appearance of a shared moral and technical project, global health is by no means a unified field. Indeed, different projects of global health imply starkly different understandings of the most salient threats facing global populations, of the relevant groups whose health should be improved, and of the appropriate justification for health interventions that transcend national boundaries. The capacity of innovations in the life sciences to improve global health, I want to suggest, will depend on the kind of global health problem that is being posed. Let me try to illustrate this point uh, with an anecdote from my ethnographic field research in Argentina in the late 1990s and early 2000s, as I focused on an effort by a French genomics firm to discover genes linked to mental disorder among patients in a Buenos Aires public hospital. Using blood samples gathered by the hospital's psychiatrists, the company hoped to find and patent sites of genetic variation that could be shown to increase the risk of developing bipolar disorder or manic depression. Given the high prevalence of bipolar disorder in Western Europe and North America, it was hoped that proprietary knowledge about diagnostic loci or potential drug targets might lead to lucrative licensing arrangements with major pharmaceutical firms. The research raised a number of ethical and political questions. What kind of consent did the subjects give? Would they receive direct benefits, whether therapeutic or monetary, based on the contribution of their DNA to the study? Should loci of genetic variation linked to disease risk even be patentable by biotech firms in the first place? But the French genomics company, or rather the hospital contracted to, to gather bipolar patients' blood samples, initially faced a more practical challenge. There were no bipolar patients to be found in Buenos Aires. Bipolar disorder was very rarely diagnosed there. The predominant epistemology of the mental health world was strongly psychoanalytic and eschewed the standardized method of disease classification that undergirded the genomics study. 
the doctors at the hospital had to produce a population of bipolar subjects before they could gather samples of patients' DNA. In other words, the problem of bipolar disorder was only as global as the knowledge forms and practices of classification through which it could be recognized. This is a truism of the field of historical ontology. Particular diseases do not exist outside of the epistemic and governmental systems that make them a target of knowledge and intervention. In what follows, I will make a parallel argument about a different set of global health problems that are being addressed today by genomic technologies, emerging infectious disease. To do so, I'll describe two public controversies around techniques for anticipating and managing pandemic threats. These controversies can be seen as critical moments in which actors challenge the authority of public health experts to define and respond to global health threats. In both cases, as we will see, the grounds for such contestation was one of impurity, that is the contamination of the value of health provision by commercial imperatives. For my purposes, however, they are most interesting as situations that reveal the underlying structure of divergent normative orders or regimes of global health provision, and the fragility of the assemblages that have formed over the past two decades or so to govern microbial threats at a global scale. Critical moment one, viral sovereignty. The first controversy unfolded in the summer of 2008 at the height of global efforts to prepare for the onset of a deadly pandemic of avian flu. In an opinion piece published in the Washington Post, US diplomat Richard Holbrook and science journalist Laura Garrett sharply criticized the concept of what they called viral sovereignty, by which they meant the extremely dangerous idea that sovereign states could exercise over ownership rights over samples of viruses found in their territory. Holbrook and Garrett were incensed by the Indonesian government's refusal to share samples of H5N1 avian influenza with the World Health Organization's Global Health, or sorry, Global Influenza Surveillance Network, which is pictured here. Global health experts feared that H5N1, which had already proven highly virulent, would mutate to become easily transmissible among humans, in which case a worldwide calamity could be at hand. In anticipation of such a transformation event, the surveillance network served as a global early warning system, enabling influenza experts to track genetic changes in the virus that might lead to a deadly pandemic. As the country where the most human cases of H5N1 had been recorded, Indonesia was a potential epicenter for such an event. For this reason, the health ministry's decision to withhold <coughs> samples of the virus from the WHO undermined the surveillance, net the surveillance network's function as a global monitoring system. From Holbrook and Garrett's vantage, Indonesia's, Indonesia's action posed a significant threat to global health. In this age of globalization, they wrote, failure to make viral samples open source risks um, allowing the emergence of a new strain of influenza that could go unnoticed until it is capable of exacting the sort of toll taken by the pandemic that killed tens of millions in 1918. They argued that Indonesia had not only a moral, but also a legal obligation to share its viruses with the World Health Organization. The country's action violated the recently revised international health regulations, which held the status of an international treaty for WHO member states. Holbrook and Garrett suggested that the rational and beneficent technocracy of the WHO was faced with anti-scientific demagoguery that threatened the world's health. They painted a picture of the Indonesian health minister, Siti Fadila Supari, as an irrational populist who sought to make domestic political gains through unfounded attacks on the international health community. As it turned out, the controversy was somewhat more complicated than Holbrook and Garrett allowed. Beginning in 2006, at Supari's behest, the Indonesian health ministry had stopped sharing isolates of H5N1 victims with the WHO surveillance network. The motive for Supari's directive was the revelation that an Australian pharmaceutical company called CSL had developed a patented vaccine for avian flu using an Indonesian strain of the virus, a vaccine that would not be affordable to most Indonesians in the event of a deadly pandemic. More generally, Given the limited number of doses that could be produced in time to manage a pandemic, 
experts acknowledged that poor countries would have little access to such a vaccine. In other words, while Indonesia had been delivering virus samples to WHO as part of a collaborative early warning mechanism, its citizens would not be beneficiaries of the biomedical response apparatus that had been constructed to prepare for a deadly pandemic. For the Indonesian health minister, this situation indicated what she called a dark conspiracy between superpower nations and global organizations like the WHO. Though less suspicious of health officials' intentions than Supari, a number of Western commentators were sympathetic to the Indonesian position on the grounds of equity in the global distributions of essential medicines. The WHO critics had a point, one wrote. Poor developing nations are often priced out of needed medicine, and they're likely to be last in line for vaccine during a pandemic. And another commented, to ensure global health security, countries have to protect the well-being not only of their own patients, but also those of fellow nations. Supari, in turn, challenged the very terms through which the surveillance network operated. It should no longer be seen as a neutral and obligatory mechanism for mitigating collective risk, she argued. Rather, it must be understood as an exchange network in which Indonesian contributions would have to be reciprocated through the sharing of benefits. Here, the Indonesian minister was speaking from, from within a different problematic than that of Holbrook and Garrett. Supari invoked a mechanism intended to encourage sustainable development, a convention of bi on biological diversity, in order to ground a rhetoric of national sovereignty that ran counter to the transnational authority of the WHO. But her critique of the high price of patented vaccines also resonated with calls to ensure global access to life-saving medicines coming from the world of humanitarian biomedicine. A technical and political system designed to prepare for catastrophic disease outbreaks was facing a very different demand, a call for access to essential medicines based on a vision of global equity. The potential for a deadly pandemic had led to an encounter between two different ways of conceptualizing the problem of global health. At stake was not only the issue of how best to respond to a global influenza outbreak, but more broadly, how to define the political obligation to care for the population's health in a globalizing world in which the capacity of national public health authorities to protect citizens' well-being was increasingly in question. In the end, the WHO sought to ensure the functioning of its surveillance system through a lengthy set of negotiations, which led, in 2011, to the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework in order to, continuing, to continue having access to Indonesian H5N1 strains the framework acknowledged the principle of, so of sovereignty over biological resources, established a transparency mechanism to track the circulation of virus samples, and required the use of material transfer agreements when biological samples were provided to vaccine manufacturers. Holding together a fragile antimicrobial assemblage thus required a delicate set of diplomatic maneuvers. Let me describe these two regimes of global health in more detail. Global health security focuses on emerging infectious disease, which are seen to emanate from the poorer parts of the world, but to threaten the economies and populations of wealthy countries. Its most representative pathogens include Ebola, SARS, and weaponized smallpox. But what is crucial is that this regime is oriented toward disease outbreaks that have not yet occurred, and that may never occur. For this reason, its advocates seek to implement systems of preparedness for events whose probability is not quantifiably calculable, but whose political, economic, and health consequences could be catastrophic. Some examples include this virus hunting initiative to sample African bushmeat in order to, quote, stop the next pandemic before it starts. Syndromic surveillance systems that track anomalous events, such as spikes in over-the-counter medication sales, in order to detect the onset of unfamiliar diseases. And, most recently, gain-of-function research that genetically re-engineers pathogens in order to increase their virulence or transmissibility as a means of assessing the risk of a pandemic. And I should mention that this case, um, which I think Melanie discussed as well is one that's still unfolding, and I think it will be to a topic of one of the uh, later panels <clears throat> this afternoon.
The second regime, humanitarian biomedicine. In contrast, targets diseases that currently afflict populations in poor countries, such as malaria, TB, and HIV AIDS. It's problematic as one of alleviating the suffering of individuals regardless of national boundaries or social groupings. As a socio-technical project, this regime seeks to bring advanced biomedical innovation to those in need. Whereas global health security develops prophylaxis against potential threats at home, humanitarian biomedicine allocates resources to mitigate present suffering in distant places. Some of its well-known initiatives include the UN Global Fund, the Gates Foundation's Millennial Challenge Grants, and uh, Médecins Sans Frontières' Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative. Each of these regimes has arisen in response to a perceived crisis of existing nation-state-based systems of public health and medical provision. From the vantage of global health security, this crisis comes from the recognition that existing health systems are inadequate to prepare for and manage the catastrophic threat of emerging disease. For humanitarian biomedicine, the crisis comes from the failure of, de of development efforts to provide adequate health infrastructure to lessen the burden of treatable but still deadly maladies in poor countries. From the perspective of this regime, human suffering demands urgent and immediate response outside of the framework of state sovereignty. Both of these regimes were shaped in significant ways by the HIV AIDS emergency of the 1980s and 1990s. For global health security, the emergency was a harbinger of further pandemics to come, an indication that globalization and ecological incursion were inviting zoonotic disaster. For humanitarian biomedicine, the failure of the pharmaceutical industry to make AIDS drugs available to dying patients in poor countries helped inspire a, briar, a, a broader series of initiatives to extend access to life-saving medications to suffering populations. Each regime is global in the sense that it strives to transcend certain limitations posed by the national governance of public health. However, the type of ethical and political obligation implied by a project of global health depends upon the regime in which the question is posed. The connection between health advocates and the afflicted, or potentially afflicted, can be one of either moral obligation to the other or protection against risk to the collective self. In launching their critique, Holbrook and Garrett sought to pressure the Indonesian health minister into compliance with global disease surveillance needs on the grounds of protection against shared risk, a goal that was undermined by Supari's ability to defend herself according to a different regime based upon the norm of common humanity and buttressed by her demonstration of links between WHO surveillance efforts and pharmaceutical industry profits. This brings me to the second uh, critical moment I want to describe. It also involves a public unveiling of hidden ties between global health officials and pharmaceutical firms, while at the same time revealing divergent normative assumptions about global health needs. The 2002-2003 outbreak of SARS, followed soon after by the re-emergence of H5N1 influenza, led to the implementation of an array of pandemic preparedness measures in North America and Europe, which included contractual agreements between national governments <laughs> and pharmaceutical firms to secure potentially scarce stocks of antiviral medication and influenza vaccine in the event of a pandemic. In the spring 2009, this preparedness system was put to a test, though in an unexpected way. A different type of influenza, not avian, but swine flu, appeared in North America and soon spread to other sites of disease surveillance. WHO declared the event a public health emergency of international concern in late April, and in mid-June, the agency announced a full-scale global pandemic. With this declaration, national and public health agencies were officially placed on emergency footing, and existing national preparedness plans were put into action. Over the following weeks, European and North American governments activated billions of dollars worth of advanced market commitments with vaccine makers to procure H1N1 vaccine for mass immunization campaigns that were to begin during the fall season. At that time, humanitarian biomedicine advocates noted that there was little effort to ensure that vaccines would be available in poor countries. 
the head of the uh, Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria said, it's another example of the gap between the North and South. In the North, vaccines are being stockpiled. Antiviral viral drugs are being stockpiled. In the South, there are neither diagnostics nor treatment. And this critique was certainly confirmed over the course of the epidemic the following year. Early in the following year, however, the critique of pandemic preparedness measures took a different turn. As of the spring 2010, in Europe and North America, the appropriateness of the intensive preparedness efforts that had been undertaken in response, or in anticipation of H1N1, came under critical scrutiny. It was no longer a problem of too little access to drugs in the South, but rather a surfeit of medication in the North. The United States had spent $1.6 billion on over 200 million doses of vaccine in what the Washington Post called the most ambitious immunization campaign in US history but had in the end used less than half of the vaccine that it had ordered. And European countries had for the most part used far less of their available stocks. Marc Gentilini, the former president of the French Red Cross, criticized the French government for its extravagant spending on the H1N1 vaccination campaign. While France had spent hundreds of millions of euros on vaccine purchases, less than 10% of its population had been immunized as of January 2010, and the country sought to unload its excess vaccine supplies on the developing world at bargain prices. Preparing for the worst wasn't necessarily preparing correctly, said Chantilly. In turn, President Sarkozy defended himself on the grounds of prudence against accusations that his government had overreacted to the threat. I will always prefer to be too prudent when it comes to people's health, they not enough. And Foreign Minister Bernard Kushner, no stranger to, to disease emergencies, remarked, I'm scandalized by the fact that this is a scandal at all. Critics argued that billions of dollars spent on vaccine had been squandered in managing a disease that turned out to be less dangerous than seasonal flu. In testimony before hearings at the Council of Europe, German epidemiologist Ulrich Kehl accused health agencies of misallocating resources that could have been devoted to diseases that currently kill millions per year. Governments are paying lip service to the prevention of these great killers and instead are wasting huge amounts of money by investing in pandemic scenarios whose evidence base is weak, he said. Such criticism challenged a fundamental pre premise of global health security, that the need for ongoing vigilance against the onset of an event that has never before occurred must be prioritized. In fact, Kale was speaking from within an older, though venerable, regime of public health provision, one that focuses, in, focuses on reducing the risk of disease in specific national populations, and that grounds legitimate intervention on the basis of a cost-benefit analysis. From the vantage of classical public health, inter intervention must be justified using data on epidemiological risk, as Kale argued, I want to point out that of the 827,000 deaths in 2007 in Germany, about 359,000 come from cardiovascular diseases, 217,000 from cancer, 4,968 from traffic accidents, 468,000 from HIV AIDS, and zero from SARS or avian flu. So epidemiologically, the, H5, the H1N1 preparations didn't make sense according to Kiel. Others claimed that an ethical lapse among global health experts, rather than evidence of risk, had led to the intensive global response to H1N1. The chair of the European Council's Health Committee argued that the pandemic declaration had been one of the greatest scandals of the century, decrying pharmaceutical industry influence on public health decision making and conflict of interest within WHO, whose experts were paid consultants to vaccine manufacturers. In June 2010, so this, this case is, of course, familiar here in the UK. Um, in, in June 2010, the British Medical Journal reported on the results of the Council of Europe's inquiry, emphasizing the unstated conflicts of interest that had, it suggested, led to the rash declaration of pandemic emergency. However, these critics claim that the WHO pandemic declaration and the billions of dollars in vaccine spending that followed were the result of a conflict of interest among WHO experts, ignored the internal logic of the agency's response to swine flu. 
If one considers the intensive prep preparedness plans that have been put in place in anticipation of a rapidly spreading, highly virulent form of influenza with the potential to kill tens of millions, it was not a question of whether they had acted more or less rationally. Rather, the question was, according to which form of rationality should one act? The development over the prior decades of a regime of global health security oriented toward intensive intervention in advance of disease catastrophe had made the decision to enact emergency measures at the first signs of potential disaster, not just thinkable, but arguably inevitable. At the same time, the legitimacy of this regime hinged on the credibility of its claim that urgent measures were necessary, even in the absence of definitive evidence of, of oncoming catastrophe. In the wake of an event that seemed less serious than promised, authorities found themselves vulnerable to an attack on their ethics launched by critics skeptical of the very premise of the normative order of global health security. In its later evaluation of its handling of the case, WHO defended its experts' integrity, but acknowledged the need for greater transparency and flexibility to accommodate unexpected and changing conditions. To conclude, these cases indicate that bridging the gap between the cutting edge life sciences on the one hand and problems of global health on the other will require more than straightforward translation of results from the scientific bench to the developing world bedside. Or simply galvanizing enough political will and economic resources to provide the poor world with access to the biomedicine of the wealthy. Rather, it must also address the question of the kind of global health problem one seeks to address. As we have seen, depending on the regime in which it is posed, the disease problem of influenza will appear quite differently and will involve different solutions. This is also true, I would argue, of other conditions such as HIV, AIDS, drug-resistant tuberculosis, and malaria. To make a fragile assemblage of global health provision pull together requires harmonization across these varying regimes, which is not only a technical problem, but also an ethical and political one. Thank you.